ladies and gentlemen, this, uh, these three talks, which depending on circumstances uh, may be um, extended in uh, January, have a, have a kind of a curious little history because last February uh, I received a gift from a, a long-time friend of mine, uh, uh, a, a book which I have been talking about for decades, but the book was not available except in ancient Greek. Um, uh, um, it is called an ancient dream manual, Artemidorus's interpretation of dreams. And so my friend Tony Bertero, who is a, a fine classical scholar, had provided me with this book. It's the, the only translation really that is uh, available. And so I was tremendously happy and uh, the donor uh, came for the first lecture and everything, we had a full house. And then the next week we had to close down because of the, uh, uh, well, the, the bug. Yeah. <laughs> and so they, we started a series of talks on this subject and we never could continue with it, less than finish it because of that circumstance. So I thought, well, now maybe, maybe uh, we'll be able to deal with it now. Uh, and those, those who have heard some of my lectures in past years, uh, almost uh, you know every other year or so, I would do a series on dreams, and I always mentioned. Uh, 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 Artemidorus of Daldis um, as the founder really of dream interpretation uh, in a context which is much more acceptable to our age and to, to the era of Freud and Jung and people of that sort. Um, in fact, many, uh, many Jungians uh, uh, use Artem Artemidorus even today. And so I would like to now catch up on what we were not able to uh, complete. Uh, I think all of us have our own personal reasons uh, for being interested in dreams, and they will be uh, uh, at variance with each other in, in different ways. Um, I uh, uh, could autobiographically as old people are wont to do, you know, because old age is, uh, brings reminiscences. You remember things that happened 60 years ago, 70 years ago, and you don't remember what happened this morning. It's just a curious condition that arises. Uh, in any event, um, uh, I would say that uh, I can say honestly, I would say that I can say, well, I would, I would say that I can declare honestly that in my life, a dream which I had very, very early in my childhood, according to my mother, I was three years old when I had it, had um, beca become the, one of the most important items of guidance and information in my entire life. Uh, I am, am not here to engage in a dream autobiography, but let's say just very, very quickly, uh, um, I, I, uh, I had a very, uh, very understanding and very wise set of parents. And uh, my father, uh, in the good old days before the Russians came and all of that, every morning would uh, um, uh, call me into the dining room where he was uh, uh, having his breakfast and he would uh, uh, ask me to do two things. First, he said, son, bring in the newspaper. Uh, so I went to the door and brought in the newspaper. He said, fine. And then after, uh, after I was about four years old, I could read at least the headlines to him. And then the second thing was, well, sit down, son, and tell me, what did you dream? And so it was the result of uh, this request on the part of my fathers that I uh, 
disclosed to him that particular dream and what it concerned was a, a symbolic figure and a symbolic event which subsequently I discovered was a, an important figure in Gnostic thought. And so it was identified to me as well. You know, you, you had a dream there about a Gnostic motif. Then I said, well, I've got to find out what Gnostic is. And from then on, I was on the, uh, on the search. And every encyclopedia, every book that possibly could have had something in it about Gnosticism, I went after it. Uh, and uh, the result of it was that I became a devoted uh, student and devotee, a devoted devotee, I don't know, sort of engaging in these tautologies tonight, a devoted devotee of Gnosticism for the rest of my life. It all started with a dream. Uh, so I would say that that convinced me for the rest of my life that dreams can be indeed very, very important. Now, uh, uh, there was a rabbi, I have him written down uh, some uh, Kabbalistic rabbi of some note in the Middle Ages uh, who said that a dream not interpreted is like a letter on red. And, uh, and I think that's a, that's a fairly uh, uh, fine way of putting it because uh, the, the meaning arises as the result of bringing our consciousness to bear on uh, uh, the dream and on deriving a meaningful interpretation for us. Now, the interest of uh, humans in dreams um, varied throughout history. I would say that the majority of the times throughout the centuries, people felt that dreams were important. Mm -hmm. Here and there, uh, a period of history arose wherein that was no longer the case. And this was primarily in the era of rationalism, which sort of had its beginnings in the late 18th century and then lasted through the 19th century. Uh, um, but then fortunately uh, waned considerably uh, thereafter. Uh, in German, which is my second uh, uh, second native language. I don't know, was I born twice? Uh, uh, anyhow, in, in German, there was a, a saying originating at that time, Träume sind Schäume, which, which means dreams are just a lot of foam, a lot of bubbles. Uh, and that, of course, is a, a put down on the dream. But interestingly enough, uh, these uh, periods of unbelief regarding the dream never last very long. And so after a, probably a little less than a century passed, there came the dapper Viennese physician Sigmund Freud with his nice little fragrant cigars uh, and uh, published his chief work, uh, which was published, uh, he, he published it right around, right in the, in the year 1900 in German. Uh, and the title of it, The Interpretation of Dreams. And that was the beginning of modern psychology, uh, of psychoanalysis, and of a new interest in dreams. Uh, so uh, fortunately, the uh, the terrible, the uh, uh, the dream, dreamless or the anti-dream era did not last very long. Uh, now uh, we have records of um, uh, dream interpretation uh, that goes back thousands of years in the pyramid texts of Egypt, uh, which are probably some of the 
the oldest available written documents where there could be some Sumerians too. Uh, there are uh, uh, numerous uh, uh, interpretations of dreams, um, uh, sort of in the nature of a dream dictionary. Mm. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, I have them written down there, but I think I can call on them as of my mem memory. For instance, that if you uh, if you dream uh, about uh, a snake, uh, um, what the, what does that mean? Well, it's it's good because you are probably going to be healed of an illness. Somehow, uh, the therapeutic arts and snakes have been symbolically connected for a long, long time. Well, I've known a few doctors who were snakes. Uh, uh, but certainly not all of them. Uh, you know, th things of that sort. Uh, very much like even today you can find sort of cheap, cheap little cu curio shops, dream book. And then you, you say, cat, black, uh, good. Uh, and, you know, means that you will, uh, you will come by some money. Or, or you know, various uh, various things of that sort, of a very uh, very uh, concrete and very materialistic nature, and primar primarily oriented to the notion that the dream is to be understood as a prophetic device that forecasts the future. So, if you dream of a certain thing, then such and such will happen. Uh, well, of course, um, as we have come to discover throughout the ages, that's a very uh, primitive and uh, not very truthful interpretation. Only in a secondary sense uh, can it become truthful in, in the way that we uh, certain uh, uh, recognitions and insights will arise in our minds which then may cause some change in our lives, which may be helpful to us in, in solving various problems, but it's never just a plain prediction about uh, the future. So there's been a great deal of uh, interest in uh, dreams. I could go on and on, which I'm not going to do. Uh, but let's say, um, uh, one very important use, which certainly is a little more modern in its uh, applicability, is that uh, dreams were considered from a very early uh, time on as having uh, healing qualities. Healing through dream. I may come around to that at greater length later on. But what is meant there to a major extent is that where people were afflicted by illnesses, by difficulties, both physical and what now we would call psychological, uh, very often they would dream uh, and the dream brought some insight and some disclosure concerning the nature and uh, possibly the, uh, uh, the uh, therapeutic uh, devices that may have been useful to employ to cure that person. And so in, uh, particularly in the uh, Alexandrian period of uh, late antiquity, uh, uh, on the Greek and Egyptian influence, uh, entire temple compounds were uh, uh, constructed, devoted to healing, and therein the priests of Asclepius, the, the healing god, would uh, uh, make a great deal out of the people's dreams. And it was that the people would come and stay there overnight. This has been called incubation. The term is still used in contemporary medicine that a certain, in a different way, that a certain illness has an incubation period. You get 
shouldn't even bring up such nasty things in order that you, you, you get infected at a certain time and there is an incubation period of so many days before you experience symptoms. But the original incubar, incubare in Latin means you come and lie down. Uh, you lie down and sleep there. And then in the morning, the priests of Esclapius would come and uh, say, all right, come on, get up and tell us what did you dream. Oh, well, uh, sir, uh, I did. What do you mean you didn't dream anything? You did dream anything. So they would have way, ways of, uh, uh, of coercing the person to remember and to disclose the dreams and then on the basis of these memories of the dreams, they would suggest both a diagnosis, a prognosis, and treatment of their condition, often a physical condition. Uh, so those are some of the really early practices. But so the dreams were always considered very important. And at times, um, uh, the uh, the, the primitive view is not entirely to be disdained because at times there would um, be prophetic elements present also, but usually uh, symbolic, so that they, the symbolism would have to be understood and then with that uh, the person could be told, well, such and such a development in your life is likely to occur. So dreams were very uh, important to people for a very long time. And the reason for that, and we might as well put that into the mix right now, the reason for that from a contemporary psychological point of view, um, uh, may be defined as something is trying to communicate to you. Now, not necessarily uh, the god Esclapius or not anybody else, but there is something inside of you that is attempting to disclose something that it knows, but you, the conscious, uh, uh, present human ego does not know. We have source, sources of knowledge, uh, sources even of wisdom, uh, and certainly sources of meaning within us, which apparently are uh, desirous of disclosing themselves to us. We have, we have a multiplicity of uh, beings within us, and some of them are, as I am sure you are aware, troublemakers who try to make us do things and think things that would be just as well left undone and unthought. But there are other factors within us uh, which are it would seem eager to be helpful to us. Want to bring forth meaning and understanding that they possess and that we at the conscious level do not possess. And what I have just uh, uh, tried to convey to you right now is the basis of psychoanalysis or analytical psychology, or any of the depth psychological uh, uh, views of, on dreams, because they all feel that at the unconscious level, well, which uh, Freud called das Unbewusste, the unconscious, now not subconscious, no, the unconscious. at the unconscious level, there is information and there is wisdom. And at times even uh, um, uh, there are certain directions for us to follow which might be helpful to us in our uh, lives. Uh, and that is really the, uh, the, I would say, the deep view of dreams and also a view whereby we can look upon the dream 
for the souls of the dream as our friend. And uh, considering the nature of this world and all the things that go on in it, we certainly uh, can use a friend now and then. Uh, this then um, needs to be kept in mind. Uh, but let us, as I say, there is always a, in these matters, there is always a low road and a high road. And the low road is just what I mentioned to you. Uh, what I, I had you know, people, students, pe people like yourselves who came to classes, lectures, those who come to me innumerable times um, and ask me, well, I had such and such a dream. I want to tell you of my dream, all right. Uh, um, and then the next question is, what does that mean? What is going to happen to me? In other words, once again, it's the prophetic element. And uh, you, you put, I particularly noticed that to be almost uniformly the attitude toward the dream of people who come from the Middle East. Uh, in Middle Eastern culture, the, uh, the uh, possible prophetic uh, meanings of dreams are considered very, very important. But as I indicated, the, the prophetic element may be considered but only indirectly. Now, um, what about what about this man Artemidorus, whom um, uh, many of us you know, thought so uh, highly, and I think um, uh, justly so. First of all. Uh, the uh, the ancient world by which I now mean the ancient Mediterranean world, Greco, Roman, Egyptian, primarily the great cultures that settled around the uh, the Mediterranean Sea had a a lot of interest in and uh, many uh, techniques whereby to address uh, the dream. Uh, and as I mentioned already, the use of dreams within the healing arts was very extensive. Uh, and uh, we might ask, why should that be so? Why should people have a, a natural feeling for the possibility that in their dreams there might be a help for them, for physical and uh, psychological uh, difficulties. Uh, and uh, th that in itself is a significant question. And I would say the answer to that is that because the ancients had a sense of the connectedness of the various parts that make up the human being. Uh, uh, this does not mean that they reduced mind and body to one thing, uh, or that they uh, exaggerated the role of the brain, uh, as uh, is often done uh, today. You know, an awful lot of people throughout history uh, uh, from uh, the steppes of Siberia and from the Himalayan mountains to the American continent all had a uh, had ideas that we don't think with our head we think with our heart the heart was considered by an awful lot of people throughout history as the uh, the seat and the origin of what today we would call a consciousness. C.G. Jung, uh, whom I uh, almost always uh, invoke as, as my uh, uh, prophetic uh, psychological guide, C.G. Jung became very friendly with, a, uh, with an Indian chief uh, whose 
whose name was uh, some kind of lake. Anyway, they, they really became friends and when Dr. Hume went with him to the Pueblo, he was a, the, the chief was a Pueblo, in, Pueblo Indian, uh, Native American. Uh, and they, he showed Jung the, the caves of the, the ancient Pueblo Indians and all of that. And then uh, as they became friendly, uh, the, the chief said to Dr. Jung, uh, you know, the white man is crazy. And Jung said, well, I'm a psychiatrist. I know something about that. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, uh, and he said, why do you think the white man is crazy? The white man is crazy because he thinks with his head. He says, that's no good. You shouldn't do that. You have to think, you should think with your heart. And of course, Jung interpreted that uh, metaphorically and symbolically and felt that was a very, uh, a very fine uh, recognition. Uh, so uh, uh, let's see, see, in the same way, many of the ancient people in the Mediterranean cultures and elsewhere, they discerned the, the underlying connections between what today we call body, uh, conscious mind or unconscious mind. Uh, they discern that when the extroverted conscious mind goes to sleep, which is what happens when we go to sleep, because uh, we had enough uh, uh, concerns during the day with this, that, and the other thing, with paying our bills, or with uh, uh, whether if we go to the grocery store, we are uh, going to uh, be infected by the, the, the Wuhan bug, or you know various concerns of that sort, uh, and uh, then we put that aside and we go to sleep. And when we do that, then some other uh, sources come forth. Uh, and uh, the the ancients discerned that when this conscious, what we now call the conscious mind, goes to sleep then certain deeper reservoirs of insight uh, become uh, available. Uh, for instance, in Delphi, in Greece, the world famous shrine of Apollo, uh, uh, god of wisdom, one of several gods of wisdom, uh, was also known as the shrine of oracles. Among them was a dream oracle. Uh, the uh, other than the famous Delphic oracle, the Pythoness, you know, after whom the, the snake Python is uh, named, because uh, uh, the, great, the great oracle of Delphi was a psychic, uh, mediumistic uh, woman who uh, sat on a tripod uh, and over a, an opening in the earth from whence uh, some sort of uh, uh, sulfurous emanations would come forth, which obviously induced the change of consciousness, and then she would uh, prophesy and you know, give her disclosures. But the, the, the mythos attached to it was that there was a, a a spirit snake, a great big spirit snake, a python, mm. and that the python would come and take possession of her consciousness, and that is how she would be able to talk. But that was the big uh, famous oracle, but there was a dream oracle as well. And then there are the therapeutic uh, custom of incubation, which I mentioned, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the, both in Greece and in Egypt, uh, um, and, and uh, the, uh, uh, but once again, it's not just simply uh, uh, asking somebody to go to sleep and talking to them, but there were several steps which we may consider within our own circumstances as being helpful to us also. Uh, First of all, the, the patient was taught how to dream. 
and how to remember his or her dream. Uh, because most people needed some uh, training in that respect. And then secondly, um, uh, the, uh, the patient was taught how to recount the dream upon awakening to the priest, and then came the uh, interpretation. Uh, uh, so the dreams were considered in a very serious light in the ancient Mediterranean world. Uh, as a nice little poetic proof of that, I'll just read to you a little, uh, a little paragraph from the Odyssey uh, of Homer in Book 29, where Penelope speaks to Odysseus, the traveler, uh, and says to him, Penelope is one of the one of the strange and fascinating women which Odys whom Odys Odysseus encounters on his trips. Quite quite a lot of them actually. Mm -hmm. uh, also Odysseus. Uh, he encounters the Cyclops who has a big uh, eye in the middle of his head and all kinds of things. But here is Penelope speaking to Odysseus. Stranger, verily dreams are hard and hard to be discerned, nor are all things therein fulfilled for men. Twain are the gates of the shadowy dreams. The one is fashioned of horn and one of ivory. The one is more, more valuable than the other. Such dreams as pass through the portals uh, of sawn ivory are deceitful and bear tidings mm. that are unfulfilled. But the dreams that come forth through the gates of polished horn, being a true issue, whoever of mortals, and, and they, they, they bring a true issue to, to whatever mortals uh, behold them. Uh, so it, it was a you know, very, very commonly accepted notion that dreams were uh, meaningful. Now, um, in view of the uh, limitations of time uh, under which we labor, no. I really have to come to Artemidorus. Uh, what the book that I am referring to now, which just recently was published, and which I th is really very unique because only uh, fragments of Artemidorus's writing on your Critica have been available in translation before, and this is one of the best uh, uh, collections. Uh, but let's say. Uh, uh, it is called an ancient dream manual. Uh, Artemidorus is the interpretation of dreams by, by Peter Tonemon. It was published by Oxford University in this uh, fateful and uh, in many ways so unhappy year of 2020. Uh, Artemidorus of Daldis was a Greek uh, philosopher. Uh, of the uh, later uh, uh, period of Greek history. Um, uh, he uh, had a visitation, believe it or not, in a dream, what else, by uh, a god. And the god, so he said, revealed to him the intricacies of interpreting dreams. And uh, from Artemidorus' uh, uh, work already thus far, because I say there have been portions published, uh, uh, there are some important uh, uh, general conclusions could have been drawn, and these are important for us now. Uh, and I will just quickly go through them now, and we'll go do a little more detail next time. Uh, first of all, to put it in contemporary language, not in, in, in ancient Greek symbolism, 
the dream is a uh, something that is necessary. Uh, if we don't dream, there is something wrong with us. Now you might say, but uh, I don't uh, dream, I hardly ever dream. Well, uh, you're not phrasing it properly. It means that you don't remember your dreams, which is true of most of us much of the time. And the dream recall, as uh, it, it's called nowadays, can be cultivated, but you have to work on it. Uh, and you have to cultivate within yourself a receptivity for that strange uh, unconscious within us that is trying to uh, tell us something. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, so, so it, is a, a, uh, it is really a necessity that, that the dream should be uh, revealed. There was a, um, an experiment conducted, I think, in the, uh, and they don't usually quote those things, uh, probably in the early 1950s, because it was around the time when I uh, came here uh, and was sort of a sensation. At Maimonides Hospital and Medical Center in New York, obviously a Jewish foundation with Maimonides, uh, and uh, uh, it was uh, a, uh, they established what they called the dream laboratory, and they were working with uh, dreams. And now this one experiment among others was that they, they took two groups of people, uh, main experimental group and the control group, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the main experimental group was uh, when they went, to, they were allowed to dream. Uh, they were allowed to, s to sleep and within their sleep to dream. With the control group, the uh, tricky doctors uh, played a trick as might be expected. And the trick was that by way of uh, EEG electroencephalograph, they c could tell when the dreaming begins in brain. Also, the, there is the, uh, the eye, the rapid eye, uh, uh, rapid eye movement where we can, the, the, the eye begins to move around underneath the eyelids as if it were looking at something. It's quite, quite interesting. So they could tell by way of the elect electrical impulses and the eye movement that the person began to dream, all right. Uh, so what did they do, the nasty people? They gave the person a little electric shock that was just enough to wake him up enough so that he, he was, did not continue dreaming. And then, then they did it again when the dream appeared. So what they did not prevent the people from sleeping, but they prevented them from dreaming. And you know what, within a, a fairly short time, of I think a month or so, every single person in, the, in that group checked out of the experiment. They didn't know why, but they just said, I, I, I don't feel good, I don't want to be here. Uh, uh, oh, my grandma needs me back in uh, Montana. Uh, or, and <coughs> They all left. They, they became disturbed, they became neurotic, they were missing something. They were missing the dream. And from this, the experimenters concluded that to dream is a, a psychological and maybe even physiological necessity. Just as sleeping is, is, a, is a necessity. Uh, as you can tell that you know many of us have uh, sleeping problems one thing or the other and then we uh, we are unhappy well in the same way when they when we we uh, uh, are prevented by some circumstance prevented from dreaming we have the same uh, difficulty uh, so what we what what we also need to uh, remember is that uh, 
and I just put it that the, the dream is a spontaneously induced altered state of consciousness. Now in the 20th century there was, you know, there has been a great deal of concern with and a lot of experiments conducted by all kinds of people with, with altered states of consciousness induced by various chemicals, LSD uh, being probably the, the most powerful and others. Now, um, the, but the dream itself is an altered state of consciousness that happens spontaneously. That in itself is quite important. Psychoanalytically, we also need to say that the dream is a communication from the so-called unconscious. And with this need to be combined the insight, and I intend to come around to this uh, next time and so forth, that dreams have their own language. Uh, that, and this is what was the great and important discovery that Sigmund Freud capitalized on, namely that there is a dream symbolism and that those, as we speak in words, in language, the dream speaks to our consciousness in symbols. Uh, uh, and that, that is really quite uh, important. Uh, then there is the, the, the recognition of the ancients, which I alluded to already, that the dream can also be a, a tool of healing, both at the physical and at the psychological level. And let's say added to, to that description would be that it also, a, a, dream, a, a dream is a, tool of the transformation of the psyche. Now this is primarily Jungian because Jung uh, came to the conclusion that what our psyche, our mind, our non-physical nature is trying to do is to change and to change in a good and in a creative way, trying to transform. That is what on the deep unconscious really wants to do. And of this transformational intention and process, the dream is a very important uh, tool. Uh, um, now then, uh, from the spiritual point of view, the ancients, including Artemidorus, also felt that the dream uh, functions much of the time as a glimpse of uh, higher worlds, of uh, realities which are ordinarily not available to us in our waking consciousness. And as such, it points to uh, uh, profound realities that we really have access to if we pay attention to the dream uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, now then, our time unfortunately is up. I am used to a little longer time than this, but these are these are now the uh, the uh, the actual uh, types of dreams that Artemidorus of Daldis wrote about. And he, we will read the various quotations and, and interpret. First of all, there is the kind of, so I just have to go through it quickly now. First of all, there is the dream, which he called, I think, the simple dream, which is a dream of events as they uh, have occurred or in part have occurred in the previous days. So there is a, a kind of dream which is a, so the way in which the mind digests what has happened. And there, is a, there are some of our dreams, I think, every night that are of, of that nature, but then usually they move on from there. Uh, 
then there is already Archimedorus uh, uh, referred to, and that's not the term that he used, this is Freud's term, the wish fulfillment dream. And I have some good quotation for that here. Uh, the, you see, this was Sigmund Freud's great uh, discovery, as he felt it. The, this is, he said, actually, that if he had not this done or discovered anything else in his life, and he led a pretty active life, and he was a good doctor and uh, you know, very, very devoted to the human mind, uh, uh, is that, that the dream is much of the time, he would say always, because Freud was very uh, dogmatic about some of his statements, that the dream is a fulfillment of a wish. Hmm? Wish fulfillment dream. Well, I think that uh, we, we may disagree with that in contemporary times, but some of it is really, uh, at least to, to some extent, it, it, it is true. Uh, the, uh, um, the Hungarians have a rustic saying that a hungry pig dreams of acorns. Now, apparently, Hungarian pigs uh, consider the acorn that comes from the oak tree a real delicacy. Uh, I am Hungarian, but I hope I'm not a Hungarian pig. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I never considered acorns to be something so terribly special, it meaning that something that you would like and you dream about it, uh, the wish fulfillment dream. Then there is uh, the nightmare, which Artemidorus calls a vision, terrifying and often, uh, often difficult uh, dreams, which, however, may indicate uh, a movement into an, an other realm of consciousness. And then uh, one that we will certainly consider in some detail uh, what we might call nowadays the parapsychological dream, Artemidorus called it a true dream, which is the perceiving of events and places which upon per later verification appear to be true. Uh, in other words, uh, this this has to do really with the uh, powers of the psyche that we ordinarily don't recognize and that we don't uh, deal with. I, I think I, I promised you that I would, would uh, uh, finish and I will, but I won't finish without uh, at least one good example of this kind of parapsychological dream. And it, uh, it is one that was familiar to me personally because it occurred to some friends of my parents. They were a young, uh, comparatively recently married couple. They lived in the city uh, and uh, uh, they, uh, the lady uh, was a pretty good dreamer. And she kept telling her husband that she had this recurring dream. And when a, do, a dream recurs or major elements in a dream recur, you have to pay attention to it. Why? Because it's like somebody wants to talk to you and he calls up and you hang up or you don't listen to him and he calls up again and again. Somebody is calling you. Mm -hmm. Somebody is trying to tell you something. So come on, you know, pay attention. Anyway, the lady kept dreaming about a house in the countryside, very great detail. And she could describe all the rooms and what was in the rooms, the road that led up to it, the trees that were outside and everything else. And so uh, they, among themselves, they referred to it as the, the dream house. So the time came when they wanted to take a vacation into the countryside. So they got a car and they drove out into the countryside. It's not, not terribly far from the capital city. It was, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe half a day or, or less drive. And then they came 
They came to a, a turn in the road and the lady became kind of excited and she said, come on, now turn this way, turn that way. She started directing her husband. She's never been physically to that area. So she started guiding him until they came to the end of the rose road where there was a house. And the lady said, look, the dream house, my dream house. So they, they were, of course, considerably impressed by that, and they wanted to know more. They went to the house, to make the long story short. They knocked on the door. The lady of the house came to the door, looked, took one look at them, and fainted oh. dead away, which is an unusual form of greeting even in the Hungarian countryside, I assure you. So she passed out, you know. So um, then when she came to, they asked her, you know, what, what's with you? And she kept pointing at the visitor, but you, you, you are a ghost. And she said, I beg your pardon, I'm not a ghost, I'm Mrs. So-and-so from Budapest. So as they then continued the discoursing, her semblance, her image had appeared in the house repeatedly, apparently during the times when she was dreaming of the house. And uh, due to some particular sensitivity or the other, the lady of the house was able to see her. So this is a more complex thing, but it is a dream involving uh, people have referred to those things as astral projection, this, that, and the other thing, mm -hmm. but it is definitely a projection of an image of the dreamer in the dream landscape. We'll talk more about those things uh, next time. Uh, and uh, uh, then there uh, was what, um, what Artemidorus referred to as the revelation of a god or of the gods in dream. Now this is the kind of dream that comes from a very profound source, which by the ancient Greeks would have been uh, equated with the world of the, of the gods. Uh, and uh, uh, what is uh, particularly important about this is that it, it is revelatory. Uh, its, its nature, its impact is such that uh, one doesn't forget it, that it comes back again and again, and that uh, have when once one has enough uh, uh, perspicacity to do so, one can ap apply the meaning of the dream again and again to various uh, developments and circumstances in the person's life. Uh, in a rather unimaginative way, my Jungian friends refer to it as a big, the, the big dream. Well, I could have thought of a little better term, <laughs> a big dream, a big deal. Uh, uh, but it, it, what it really, what it amounts to is that it is so powerful, it is so laden with meaning that as life goes on, and I can testify to that, I, I, had, I can remember about three big dreams of that sort that I had in my lifetime. Not only did I never forget them, but throughout different sec sec segments of my life, I found new meaning in them. It, the, the, a new message came forth that was applicable to that particular uh, time of my life. So it, it speak of revelation, those things are really revelatory and uh, consequently also very, very helpful. And these, of course, uh, Artemido says, come, from, come to the human being from the gods and that his dream of Apollo, which made him write the dream interpretation book, was of that sort. Now, all I was able to do within the limitations of our time was to, to uh, give you uh, little tidbits uh, 
uh, of uh, uh, a uh, wetting our appetite for these matters. But I hope you whetted the appetite sufficiently that you have an idea by now that we are really uh, dealing with a very important modality of consciousness of uh, events that occur to us uh, much more frequently than we give them credit for. Uh, uh, I sometimes remember uh, Monday's dream on, on Friday or mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, uh, and of course it requires some uh, addressing ourselves to it. And that uh, therefore um, uh, we have really a very important subject here and we have a, a, a source of information from a, you know, a quite early period of history that is utterly compatible with many later discoveries and that can um, uh, be of very great use to us. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll refer in conclusion uh, to two uh, um, dramas and their uh, names. One is very, is very famous by the, the Spanish dramatist, dramatist uh, Calderón de la Barca, uh, and it's entitled La Vida el Sueño, The Life as a Dream. Very, very interesting. And then at much, uh, much later period, there was the, the Austrian dramatist uh, Franz Gilparzer, who turned it around a little, and it's of course an entirely different story, and it says, uh, the Traum ein Leben, the dream, is, the dream is a life. So with one dream, life is a dream, and the dream is a life. And, and both of these are just indicating that uh, the dream can disclose the meaning, the, the profound meaning in the tasks of a person's life if the person is sufficiently affinitized to it. Uh, and uh, so um, I hope that this, this has been a, a, a little introduction to the subject and that we can go into, into it the next couple of times in greater detail if indeed uh, all goes well and we are able to uh, do that. And uh, I think that it will be of interest to you. And I was certainly very uh, pleased when after all those years of getting little pieces and snatches of Artemidorus, I really came across th this book. It's very, very informative. And in it, um, and in terms of commenting on it, I think we can find a great deal of meaning. And meanwhile, uh, since it is the evening and uh, you have to rush home to evade uh, the uh, the terrors of the uh, the terrors on the street the terrors of, of the uh, the uh, authorities uh, uh, why i hope that you can get home and to have really good informative insightful dreams if you do, well, maybe next time you can even tell us about it. Because I, I can assure you from uh, by now really rather long life uh, uh, that if uh, I had not been able to experience some of my dreams, my life would have been greatly impoverished. The dream can be a great and wonderful source of guidance, of wisdom, of excitement, of meaning. And if we pay attention to it, then it may happen to us more often perhaps than we think. So let's hope that we can stimulate that to some extent. And I promise you some, some good stories and some good little techniques, both from Artemidorus and otherwise next time, until which time I bid you good night and have happy dreams. <laughs> <laughs>